Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your brain. I'm Ian Wolfe, now completing week 8 of my flu and bronchitis. On this edition, Matt Todd completes his talk about open source science. But first up, here's the news. Excel Breaks Science. A team from the Faculty of Medicine and the Faculty of Engineering at Monash University, in collaboration with Baker IDI Heart and Diabetes Institute in Melbourne, found that the data in a fifth of genetic science papers is wrong because they were published with Microsoft Excel's spreadsheet files. Excel quietly changed the data in the files to what Microsoft assumed they wanted to type. Microsoft Excel, Google Sheets, LibreCalc, and Apache OpenOffice all autocorrect genes with names that look like dates or numbers into actual dates and numbers, destroying any data that isn't a number or a date, but looks like one to Microsoft's overly helpful algorithm. The only way for the research in these papers to be replicated is for the authors to re-enter the data manually and republish. Microsoft Excel is often used as a database, despite the fact that Microsoft have no way to turn off the auto-correction of auto-formatting. The danger was first highlighted in 2004 in a paper titled Mistaken Identifiers. Gene name errors can be introduced inadvertently when using Excel in bioinformatics. So, gene symbols such as SEP2, which is short for Septin2, is changed to to sept, or sometimes 2006 slash 09 slash 02. MARCH1, which is short for Membrane Associated Ring Finger C3HC41E3 Ubiquitin Protein Ligase, is converted by default to 1-MAR. Identifier numbers from the Riken Gene Database are converted into floating point numbers, so that accession code 2310009E13 is changed to an exponential number, 2.31 by 10 to the power of 13, which helps nobody. Despite the warning in 2004, biologists kept on using Microsoft Excel and Microsoft wouldn't fix the problem. When asked about turning off autocorrect in Excel in a forum, a Microsoft representative replied, The short answer is no at this time. The feature is designed with the assumption in most cases when people type date-like strings or time-like or number-like, they would want them to be typed as that data type. Auto-formatting does more than formatting, it determines the type of the data, and that in turn typically gives better experience and functionality around the input that you typed. You can do arithmetic on numbers, you can sort dates by their calendar order, you cannot do all of this on text. For the minority of cases like yours, where the date-like input is actually not dates, there are the two options you mentioned. Formatting cells as text can be done in bulk, entire ranges, columns or rows or sheets, so should not be very time consuming, although of course it does take an extra step. We're talking here about enormous amounts of data. Basically, for the last 12 years, Microsoft has been aware of the usability problem, but refused to fix it. Even if they didn't want to give you an option to turn off auto-formatting, the least they could do is give you the option to be asked for your consent before a change is made. Do you really want to change this? Instead, biologists are required to somehow know about the problem, without any documentation or training program from Microsoft, and spend time pre-formatting every cell of the spreadsheet before they enter their data, or risk losing it. Many scientists are using Excel spreadsheet as their electronic lab notes. For those people, their original data is at risk. 
One biologist in a forum commented that she'd only caught that the data had been renamed before submitting a paper. She was lucky that she had a photo of the original data to re-enter because her team had already released the new species of bat that she was studying. So she couldn't replicate her own work. The Australian team investigated the Excel problem by downloading papers and supplementary .xl and .xls files which matched the keyword genome in the title or abstract. They screened Excel files deposited in the NCBI gene expression omnibus between 2005 and 2015 in the same way. They screened over 35,000 supplementary Excel files, finding 7,500 gene lists attached to 3,600 published papers. One in five published articles with Excel files containing gene lists had errors in the gene names caused by Excel auto-format. The problem is getting worse. Their analysis showed that while there are 3.8% more papers published every year in the last five years in genomics, there are 15% more Excel-caused errors in gene names every year. In the 987 supplementary Excel files containing gene name errors that they detected, 166 files didn't contain any other identifying information, such as accession numbers or genomic coordinates, that could have been used to work out what the original gene names should be. The researchers were only able to run their testing software on open source journal articles. If the research was behind a paywall, it couldn't be included. What can biologists do? If a paper's authors want to turn 9 2 2016 back into SEPT2, they can't just reformat the spreadsheet. Doing that will turn 9 2 2016 into 42615, which is Excel's internal code for that date. Instead, they'll have to format all the cells in the spreadsheet as text and then re enter the data manually, if they still have the original data. If you want to load an Excel spreadsheet file from a paper about genetics without automatically damaging the data, you have to open a blank worksheet, then import the file as an external data from text, and trawl through the screens to set all the columns as text. Microsoft hasn't just ruined the day of many biologists by refusing to add a way to turn auto-formatting off in Excel. Britain's spy agency MI5 bugged 134 phones of the wrong people due to Excel changing the numbers. Excel changed the last three digits of the real phone numbers to 000, and so people completely unrelated to the MI5 investigation were bugged by mistake. Banks have problems with Excel's 15-digit limit on numbers because credit card numbers have 16 digits. Archaeologists find their accession record numbers, such as 6E-2, get converted to a formula by Excel, even when they format the cells as text, as instructed by Microsoft. I just hope my medical records aren't held in Excel spreadsheets. The paper was published in the journal Genome Biology and was titled Gene Name Errors Are Widespread in the Scientific Literature. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Three years ago, I visited Associate Professor Matt Todd at Sydney University with my sound recordist and videographer friend Adrian Tan. We were making a video interview for the Public Library of Science about Matt's open source scientific research into malaria. At the same time, I recorded this audio interview. I continued the interview by asking Matt, you're crowdsourcing the science. How big is the team that you're getting together? Well, we are crowdsourcing it in the sense that a crowd would be great. A crowd is not necessary because we're not asking people to do a, a repetitive task. We're asking people to give actual scientific input to the project, from, so from the ground up. So um, and lots of people would be fantastic, but we do need expert advice and we need people to make molecules. The project functions best when people contribute real experimental findings. I mean, that's the, that's the goal, really, is to coordinate that in, in a meaningful way. In the case of the Schisto project, it was about 25 people. So it's not, you don't need thousands, right? You need people who have uh, skills that the project requires. For the malaria project, I think the team is maybe about 30 or 35 at the moment. 
And again, it depends. You know, some people are making lots of molecules. Some people are contributing expert advice. Some people are acting as, as consultants to guide the project in the right way. So also with, with crowdsourcing as well, you don't necessarily have to have every participant uh, ac uh, having access to the, the, the details of the project. Whereas with open source, of course, you lay everything out and everybody have, has access to everything. So there's a, a slight dis distinction between open source and, and crowdsourcing, which I think is quite important. And you have your notebooks online? Indeed, yeah. As they're being yes, written? we do. So yes, we're no longer writing on paper, right, like Da Vinci did. We're writing on, on a computer, obviously, but also on a lab book that's online, and where there's no barrier to viewing. So there's no, you don't have to enter a password and log in to view what we're doing. And that's the crucial part of the project, is that the lab book, the, the daily detail is there. It's crucial because we want to make sure that everyone understands that everything is transparent. So any member of the team can see everything. There are no secrets. But also, just in terms of academic rigor, everything should go there. So the, the so-called so positive results and the negative results and the missteps. And if you stumble in the lab and you fall over and you, you, you drop something, you've, you've got to put that there. Everything goes up. That also means that it means that people are up to date. So if you did decide to contribute to this consortium effort, you can do that with knowing that you are up to date on what's going on. So you're not going to uh, su suggest something to the, to the team that someone's already thought of and done, and it was, it, was, it was done two months ago, but we haven't published it yet kind of thing. Everything's there today. So if you have an idea, it's likely to be relevant to what we're doing today. You also therefore plan ahead, right? So you, you have meetings online where you think, okay, well, what are we going to do now? We've got these results, what do we do now? And again, that's kind of counter to what academia normally does, which is where you do a project, you think about the data, you publish it, it comes out in a journal, and maybe there's like a year between when you've done it and when you tell people about it. That's not efficient to my mind. You know, I think it's much better if people can see what you're doing today and then feed into the project today, and that's the model we're using. And have you had people tell you that you have to change direction suddenly? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> yes, we did. The change of direction thing is, is both good and bad. I mean, it's bad for your ego because you think, well, I should have thought of that. But it's good in the sense that you are getting contribu contributions from, really, uh, from expert people. So we have had that, yes. We, we started the Shisto project in the lab back in about January 2010. And we set off on a certain direction, happily set off on this direction, all hopeful. And we got a stream of advice from the industrial community that was saying, your highfalutin academic idea about how to do this, which was in my grant proposal, is not the way to do this. You should be, you know, it's all very well, but you're not going to solve the problem in any meaningful time frame. And if you want to solve the problem, you, you need to change the direction by like 90 degrees. And so we did. We had so much advice to that effect that we changed direction and it went about the solution to the scientific problem a totally different way. Uh, in response to that kind of community feedback. Now, it wasn't easy to do that because we had to essentially abandon a route that we thought was going to be fine, uh, but we listened to the advice, right? And of course, those people then become part of the team, right? They become fully fledged members of the, of the consortium. In the malaria project, again, yes, we, we receive useful advice from people that, that constantly makes you reassess which molecules we should be making and, and how to do the project. And we had an excellent example of, of, a, of a viewer of the, of the project from afar uh, suggest something for the project that was extremely important and we would have changed direction completely, but we managed to rebut the comment and carry it on the way we were. So yes, that kind of advice is absolutely crucial to the project. And using social media to communicate? Yes, we are. I mean, well, that's, it's interesting because social media, I mean, it makes you think that we're taking you know, pictures of ourselves in the lab and, and, and getting likes and things. Social media is actually a very uh, powerful way of getting in touch with an extremely large pre-existing user base of people, people and scientists. Now, the uptake of social media in science has been slow, and I, I completely understand why that is. But actually, we need to pause for a moment and, and remember what we do in science. What we do in science is communicate what we've done. And we need to remember that something incredible has happened in the last, what is it, 15, 20 years, which is the birth of this thing called the internet. It's an absolutely transformative moment in our society that this thing exists. Um, I, I would take a picture of my son or something and put it on Facebook, and I would think nothing if my, my mom, who's the other side of the world, like that in a, few, in a few seconds, right? But we don't seem to use that for science, often, for actually doing active science. Not for talking about what we're doing, but actually doing science. And I just wonder why, we, why we're not doing that, because it's the most astonishing communication medium I've ever seen, is this ability to interact with anyone who's online instantly, uh, in a very rich way. So not just about taking pictures and liking things, but also having scientific discourse, checking data, analyzing data, having ideas that you share. It's just astonishing. Tell me about your team. Yes, sure. So the, the Malaria Project, which is the one that's currently active, 
a lot of the people working on that team are based in Sydney. We hold a grant for, for this project, so I guess we're the most active and we're currently leading it. If someone else becomes more active than us, they can, they can lead it, it's meritocratic. So yes, we do have a lot of students uh, from Sydney Uni who have been involved in it, which is really great. I mean, students are the ones who, you know, should, they're iconoclastic, right? They should challenge everything. And so you need people like that. You need the, the, the young minds coming in and challenging the way you do things. So that's been a fantastic experience from undergraduates, who some of whom have volunteered, through to Alice, who's the, the postdoc scientist in the lab at the moment, who's currently leading the synthetic effort in Sydney. So the whole range of people have had an input. We had an honor student last year called Jimmy, who I did a full year research project, uh, wrote his thesis, got examined, and when the, whole, when the examination process was complete, he posted his thesis into the public domain on a, a free service called Figshare, which allows that, uh, that thesis to be seen very widely and read by anybody. So yeah, we've sort of involved the, the malaria project with the usual academic route of having student projects and, and theses and postdoctoral research. But then beyond that, there are students in other places that are taking part. So there are students in other universities who've taken part. Uh, Patrick Thompson is a, is a a PhD student now a postdoc in Edinburgh who's a, a really active member of the team. We've had a cohort of 50 undergraduate students in America uh, make a bunch of molecules for the project which is about to be released into the public domain. So it, it ties in very well with educational projects I think, yes. On the other hand though of course we do have a lot of industrial input from scientists who are just interested in the project and, and want to take part. How did you manage to get industry scientists who normally aren't allowed to work on anything not for the company's profit to get involved? Yes, <laughs> yes they are. And, and on the Shisto project, that was the, the big surprise for us, was that so about 75% of the inputs the project had were from the industrial sector. And we puzzled over that for a while and thought, well, why are so many highly qualified industrial scientists contributing so much to the project, apparently freely? And we don't, we don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's something to do with the fact that uh, an in, uh, we're, we're, <laughs> we're all geeks under the surface, right? We love solving problems particularly if we think we can solve a problem better than, than what we are observing around us. You know, you just want to step in and say, no, 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 just do it this way, it's better. And there's the inherent satisfaction of working in a scientific field. If you're in industry, you can demonstrate your competence to the public, uh, to potential clients, without any problems of, of client confidentiality. There is, I, I suppose, good public relations for a company to contribute resources to the solution of a project that has value for public health. Yeah, so there are lots of, I think there are lots of reasons why a company might want to get involved. The, our big industrial collaborators on the malaria project are uh, GlaxoSmithKline in Madrid and Spain. And that's partly because the original data that um, is, is being used in that project comes from this enormous public deposition of anti-malarial data in 2010 from Glaxo. Thousands of molecules that are active against malaria, which were put in the public domain and of which acted as a starting point for what we're doing. What do you think are the advantages of open source science that you might end up transferring to the for-profit sector? Ah, yeah, it's a really interesting question about, about whether open source can be uh, integrated with the private sector somehow. It's a really fascinating question because on the face of it, they just seem to be polar opposites. Open source, I think, necessitates that you cannot take patents on anything because everything is, is deposited in the public domain immediately. And it's clear what you're trying to do and what you've achieved. The private sector, of course, is the opposite of that with, with patents and secrecy and so on. So it's surprising, I think, that you see so much interaction between the two and such goodwill, I think, between the two that open source practitioners love the expertise from the industrial sector. And yet the industrial sector loves to watch and participate in open source projects where it's all free. You know. So I think that the two will always be slightly different, but I, I think that there is a possibility for a great deal of interaction. Uh, companies will always, I think, want to take part. Uh, uh, practitioners of open source will always need the vast amount of expertise in industry. And that's exactly what we're seeing. So I don't think that we're ever going to merge. You know, we're not going to be bought by anybody. We're not going to be able to pay for industrial expertise. But there just seems to be this natural ecosystem where we're, we're constantly talking to each other. Uh, I mean, I should say, maybe I shouldn't say, that in, we've had so much more input from the industrial sector than the academic sector. That's partly, I think, because, well, there are a number of reasons, I guess. Academia has become quite secretive. And, and I understand the reasons for that. Uh, maybe it's gone a little bit too far, but I understand the reasons for that. Uh, whereas industrialists, I think, everyone knows that it has to be secretive, and so it's maybe a little clearer what roles people from the industrial sector can have. But it's a fascinating one. I think open source really benefits from that kind of input. There has to be some financial input to support the project, but I think it's more than that. I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a sort of uh, a common philosophy of something. 
It seems more interesting for people to be able to see what's happening in open source science that they can't see happening in private secretive science. You had an analogy to the Olympics? Oh yes. <laughs> yes, well for me that's the fascinating thing. So yes, I was thinking about the, why I like seeing the process of science. I used to watch science programs on the TV when I was a kid. And often those were programs about astronomy, astrophysics, those things. And I used to love that you could see the scientists working and how they could work and the process involved, not necessarily just the science, but how it was that people got there. So the equipment that people were using and, and, and the conversations people would have. When I was 18 or so, I, I, I won this competition. I got to take my parents to the, the telescopes on, in the Canary Islands. And one of the really great things about that was that we went up at night and went into one of these massive telescopes and saw how people worked. So saw the scientists and how they worked and what they were doing. And I loved that as a kid from school. I loved seeing that, the real process of research. And that stayed with me, I think. And I, I think that there is a great deal of fascination from the public's point of view about what actually science is, not just the end result, polished off, you know, but what actually is involved in getting to that point. Because it's completely different from school. So I think that that's part of the attraction of the open source model, is you see everything, warts and all, but also there's the fascination of the human factor. Now the analogy I was thinking about was this, I remember watching, I think it was 1984, the Olympic Games, where Carl Lewis ran the 100 meters. And he, he sets off, and, and, and he's very slow on the first 40, 40 meters, but then he overtakes everyone in the last 60, and he, he's running unbelievably fast, and just glides past everybody. Now, if you imagine rerunning that race, where all the tracks are in tunnels, and you, you can't see where everyone is until someone just pops out the other end. That's dull, right? it's a dull race right there. I wouldn't watch that. But it's the fact you can see the process of progression is so fascinating that I think that's why we want to see the process as well. I guess you could also switch this around and say, well, what about for the practitioners? So what's in it for the practitioners? What about the runners in these tunnels? If you imagine running 100 meters and you're in a tunnel and, and then you get to the end point, and then you see where you are. It's just, it's not motivating, I don't think. I think we, we do our best, we, we make the best of ourselves when we're running and you can see where everyone else is because it spurs you on to do better. So I think that's the good thing about the open approach. It's not just who gets there first, it's also how the process is done, you know, the, the pitfalls and the mistakes and the breakthroughs, to see all that happening in real time. I think if we could do that more with science, then the public would be much more interested in what's going on. Matt. Will you take the Public Library of Science challenge to summarise open source science in one minute? Okay. <laughs> okay, yes, challenge accepted. The Open Source Malaria Project is, the purpose of the project is to find a good drug for malaria, for treatment of malaria, as quickly as possible. We will do that by adopting a few general principles. One is that all data and ideas are freely shared. Second principle is that anybody can take part in the project at any level. And the third is that there will not be any patents, which means that we're committed, the project is committed to not keeping any secrets. So with those three principles, we hope to find a compound for the treatment of malaria, which would then be in the public domain and could be developed by anybody for any purpose, uh, including for the generation of a profit. What's the future? What's the next project for you? Ah, the future of open source science. Yes. For me, uh, well, for me, it's the future completely. I mean, I, I, I think that everyone who's taken part in this project, I don't want to speak to everyone, but I think that everyone who's taken part in this project is excited by it. When, when, when they do it, it's a daily, it's an exciting thing because you're sharing everything and receiving things from people you don't know. I think it has great potential outside of the area of tropical diseases. So for, for schisto and for malaria, the amount of money that you're, you could possibly make with a drug for those diseases is pretty small, if not negative. What I'd love to do, if we succeed with the malaria project, which of course is the key question, if we can do that, we could extend the approach to something like a drug for a disease which is associated, normally associated in people's minds with a profit, like cancer or Alzheimer's. Something of a dreadful public health problem which we don't really know how to solve because of its complexity, because of the fact often we don't actually know what the biology is doing. To find something which could treat people and help people using an open source model in those areas would be amazing. And that's what I'd love to do. That would require a, a, a total scale up of the open source effort where you would have funded laboratories in multiple different countries. So a huge consortium effort with the difference being that everything is shared, including to the public. So everything is open source. So not a consortium which is closed from the public, a consortium which is open to the public. So every, everything can be seen. That project would build an amazing scientific momentum, I think and allow us to make real progress 
and will be a very good use of public funds. And I, I would appeal, I think, to, uh, as an example, to the Human Genome Project, where an injection of public funds into basic science has led to an extraordinary amount of academic and industrial activity in areas that we couldn't even dream of before that project was done. I think that the Human Genome Project is one of the absolute jewels of our age. And I think we need to adopt that open data principle, transform it into an open source project where people can actually input, uh, and we can make amazing things happen, I think, if we did that. We could accelerate science? We could accelerate science. I think, without a doubt, we would accelerate science. We would make it the highest possible quality because of the, the peer review and control by everybody. And we would accelerate the process because the best people could work on the problem together. On that note, Matt Todd, thank you very much. Thank you. That was the final part of Associate Professor Matt Todd talking about open source research into malaria. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to hear your own voice on radio? We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. Send your contributions, opinions, congratulations, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and you'd like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Check out the Patreon page at patreon.com slash Diffusion Radio. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia on the community radio network, including 8 C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2MVR in Nambucca Valley and 3MBR in the Mallee border districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos from this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, then you can explore more than 850 previous episodes archived on www.diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio.